Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents. Just did a video for our student loan program providing information to the individuals who are part of that program. It has taken about the same time to take care of their documents. The only problem is we've been having to go back and redo certain sections of the document because certain things that apply to auto loans do not apply to student loans. Certain things that apply to student loans don't apply to home loans. Certain things that apply to home loans don't apply to either student loans or auto loans. But here's the point that all of you need to understand. A mortgage are types of loans that are secured by personal property. Well, your personal property is your consumer credit with a student loan. Your personal property is the car for the home, uh, the auto loan and the home for the home loan. So there is always a mortgage when we're talking about loans, but we need for you to pay attention to one thing. The federal government, moreover, does not directly guarantee a loan to a private lender, rather because they created a process through the treasury. A guarantor, typically the state or private nonprofit agency, so Ladies and gentlemen, usually your state is sitting up there guaranteeing loans, especially home loans and property loans or student loans at a student college, such as a state college. Shh, don't tell nobody. This is a secret. They don't want you to know that the government stands as guarantor. Hold on. Let me explain it to you. Nonprofit agencies such as HEAF, HEF, or GHEAC provides that private lenders with a guarantee that the loan will be repaid even if the student defaults. These guarantors, in turn, enter into a reassurance agreement, but it says with S, with the Department of Education under the Department of Education reassurance up to 100% of the guarantor's losses in paying defaulted claims. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to suggest you write the Department of Education and whomever that idiot is claiming you owe a student loan and get a copy of default claims with reference to your loan. This is being provided to you all for free. We could have kept this to ourselves, but we're not providing that information as if it's proprietary. You want to go after your student loan on your own? Knock yourselves out. But we're doing this for our clients. Thus, in the event a student defaults, the guarantor, the government, through any of these private agencies, reimburses the private lender for the loan. Wait a minute, then who reimburses them? The government. It takes assignment on a loan from the lender and then seeks reimbursement, the government, from the Department of Education. Ladies and gentlemen, here are the cases showing that that's what they do. Now, this is a document that we've just put together today for our clients. We're doing this because our clients have this as a right. People say, well, I'm going to copy what he's writing. It's okay, you can copy what I'm writing here, but you don't have all the information. There's a lot more going on with this. This is not the only document. Now pay attention to this. In order for the government to be reimbursed for having stood as guarantor, it requires the borrower to simply tender the application and the note to the Federal Reserve agent. And at that point, the Federal Reserve may or may not deposit such for reimbursement in the form of Federal Reserve notes. This provision is provided for at 59 Stat 237 subsection 2. Now, that's prima facie evidence of what the law is. 12 U.S.C. 411 and 412 is codification providing prima facie evidence, not of law, just prima facie evidence. And page 78 through 83 is the congressional record for March 1933 and subsequent amendments documenting the intentions of Congress and the agreement with the people with respect to the New Deal. Ladies and gentlemen, now you have irrefutable and unrebuttable evidence. Why? Because this was prima facie evidence. Then you incorporated what other evidence, then you incorporated what the intent of Congress. The court doesn't get to interpret this. You see, they cannot overcome this. What evidence to, can they put on the record to contradict any of this? 
because that would make the law invalid and unconstitutional. Shh, don't tell nobody. This is how you rebut their presumptions. You do it by giving them the actual, so-called, what they say, evidence of what the law is, statute at large. Of course, the Constitution, your right to property. Then you give them their so-called codification, because that's evidence. That's what they put on the record all the time. And then you give them the congressional record. And that shows what congressional intent was. See, this is what Congress said their intent was. And once you do that, now you have evidence that you place on the record. Ladies and gentlemen, K sera sera. Because once you put the evidence on the record, they can't overcome the evidence. What are they going to do? What are they going to put on the record? Did you do your job? Did you apply for Federal Reserve notes? Did you fill out a promissory note? Did you tender it to the Federal Reserve agent? Well, then you did your job. That's what the law requires. Whew, man, so glad I got that off my back. Okay, what, 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 you, what you say? I owe you some money. Oh, no, 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 I did what I was supposed to do. You better go get that from Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam said he responsible for that. You better go talk to him. Yeah, he's sitting right over there. Hey, Uncle! Yeah, they need, they need to talk to you. All right, he, he ready to talk to y'all. Oh, yeah, don't bother me no more. Cease and desist, okay? Don't come to me no more. I did what I was supposed to do. That's all you're saying, ladies and gentlemen. You know, the individual, this is what he asked me. Um, I'm getting to his text now. I, and this is our conversation, said I've been working on these docs, trying to get the wording correct, trying to prove the people, uh, well, it's supposed to be to the people, that the government is responsible for their debt and providing case law. Then I tell the person we'll speak soon. He says, okay. Then I mentioned something to him uh, as sarcastically. And he said, here's my question. Why are you still looking for more evidence that the government is responsible for the debt? Is there some proof that all the information you've provided people up to this point is hard to grasp? And I simply say, yes. And he responds, these poor people. Ladies and gentlemen, all the information you need is right here in front of you. However, what they have done is they've added so many nuances to the law that many of you are not aware of them. Okay, I'm going to segue just for a small second to explain something to you. A young man used a hour style money order from 2012 that had the treasury routing number that we told people don't use it anymore. I said, that's the treasury's routing number, it doesn't belong to you, so don't use it anymore because you won't be able to explain to them why you're using it. Well, he didn't get the memo. And so he used it and they charged him with attempt to defraud the bank, the financial institution. And he's in prison or in jail right now. But the moment he went in there starting to talk all that yang yang and all of that stuff, HR 192, well, they said he was incompetent and forced the public defender on him and won't allow him to put any documents into the record or say anything at all. So I wrote up a motion for him. Well, actually, I wrote up a petition challenging the stupid court, letting the court know that if you're going to say he's incompetent, how come he hasn't had a hearing? You see, the jail determined he was incompetent. They had a jail doctor say he was incompetent, but they didn't have an actual court hearing. The court accepted that doctor's finding and said, okay, you're incompetent. You don't get to do anything or say anything. So I wrote and said, wait, hold on. Gave him their rule. He was supposed to be given a hearing. Then he was supposed to be given a second evaluation. You guys violated the young man's due process rights. Well, I'm speaking for him in the motion. So I said, so there's, here's the demand that you provide him a second opinion as the law requires. Now, what they didn't know, but I knew, that the statute of limitation stops in his right to a speedy trial for 45 days. 45 days, every state, federal and state, 45 days, the right to a speedy trial stops while you ask for a competency hearing. Whether you ask for it or the court asks for it, 45 days, you don't have a right. And so I decided 
to recognize that he needed to get a competency hearing and he was going to wait the 45 days and he was going to be in jail 45 days. But I asked for a bail hearing pending the outcome because he has a right to bail. Whether he's incompetent or not, he has the right to bail. The court denied him the right to bail because it claimed he was incompetent. It said he was a threat to the community. How is he a threat? In what fashion, way, or form is he a threat to the community? Is he going to be a threat to someone violently? Of course not. So you have to do better than that because California especially has passed a law for nonviolent crimes are supposed to be bailable. His crime was nonviolent. At least the alleged crime was nonviolent. And they denied him. So I told him, don't worry about it. So we've already put the information and documented it on record. Held the judge for judicial malfeasance saying the judge has acted in absence of all jurisdiction. That's the only way you can charge a judge criminally is to document that they've acted in absence of all jurisdiction. Then I brought up the Civil Rights Act of 1866. We'll be talking about that in the very near future. Civil Rights Act of 1866 should be your best friend because that act was overturned by the President of the United States when he decided to veto the Congressional Act. And then Congress, like they did in the Bradley Christopher Stark case, overturned the act with a two-thirds majority. So now the Supreme Court can't touch it and the President can't touch it. The Civil Rights Act of 1866. Congress can add amendments to it, but what they can't do is they can't take away what they already did by a majority. The only people who can do that are the people because Congress overcame it with a two-thirds majority. They can't now come with a two-thirds majority and revoke the act. That takes the people to do that. Shh, don't tell nobody that. You're not supposed to know. Well, anyway, we put the document on the record, brought up a bunch of other things, not, not a lot, uh, did three different motions, petitions, to the court. The court sent it to the public defender. I told him, he told me yesterday, because he was headed to court today, he said, they sent it to the public defender, and the public defender came down to talk to me, and blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, but they didn't talk to you about the documents. They only came to just talk. They didn't talk to you about anything of any substance. I said, that's the way it's supposed to be. They can't talk to you about the documents. The document is challenging the public defender, saying that they're agent of the state, that they work for the court, and that the court cannot appoint one of its officers to represent your interests impossible that's self-serving so you want an independent officer who's not an officer of the court said they can't handle that because they don't have a procedure for that i said so here is the point the 45 days started the moment they received it it doesn't matter what the judge did with it after they received it you are just concerned with the fact that they received it i said and the second point you need to understand is that everything you need to say is already in that document. You don't need to say anything else to them. So when you go to your hearing tomorrow, you ask, has my competency hearing, that second opinion I demanded and have a right to, has it been scheduled? That's all you need to say to the judge. They sent them to offer him a plea deal. 10 months time served and a year's probation. He said, no. So they sent them to a different judge than the judge they had the first time. I didn't tell them the reason why they sent you to a different judge than the judge you had the first time is because of what I wrote. Because that idiot that they sent you to the first time is not on the level that they need to be in order to handle what I wrote. So I said, things are changing now. They're now looking at things a little bit differently and they're going to handle you a little bit differently. Why? Because you just brought to their attention that you are not just some small Joe off the street. And I said, you don't even need to write anything else in this case. Because everything you need to write, I've already done for you. I said, once they go past those 45 days, without having a valid reason, ladies and gentlemen, they don't have a valid reason. Now, they're going to claim that they're going to extend time. Now, they just said, well, the, the trial date that we had scheduled, we've had to, we had to toll that. We had to, I told them, I said, yes, because you've asked for a competency hearing. It's automatically 45 days, tolls the statute. I said, so they haven't done anything that they weren't supposed to do. I said, I've already anticipated that. That's why I keep telling you that the 45 days started the moment I placed that into the record. There is nothing they can do about it.
So I told him about the bill. Don't worry about it. He's going to get bail. If it's either now or later, he will get bail. The reason why is because the moment he asked for bail and they didn't give it to him, he gets to bring it up on appeal. Everything that they haven't done, he gets to bring on, on appeal. Ladies and gentlemen, that's my job is to know what rules are in place, what cases have been decided. I've been doing this, as I told him, for too long. I know what the courts have said. I know what the Supreme Court has said on several things. Why? Because while on vacation, I spend the time of having laws sent to me, having court cases sent to me, reading those court cases and seeing why the court made this decision or that decision. Here is your problem, everyone. No one has ever defined that a any Federal Reserve Bank, as defined in this statute right here, applies to you. That you are a banking institution as defined in law. Just that simple. Nobody has ever defined you as a banking institution. Nobody has ever defined that your loan is government guaranteed because of the March 9th, 1933 Act. That the government guarantees it and says that those companies are entitled to receive, entitled to receive reimbursement. Nobody's ever done that before. Somebody will say, yeah, I did it. No, you didn't. Because you didn't use these acts to prove your point. Then you didn't explain that, hey, I just provided y'all prima facie evidence plus evidence plus congressional record of intent. This is a rebuttable, rebutting your presumption as to everything else to the contrary. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what we're doing for our people. Now, I just did a video letting the people know why there was a delay. And the reason, most of the reason why there's a delay is because this thinking causes a lot of pain. What do I mean by pain? I don't take pain medication. Right now, my shoulder feels like it's bone on bone every time I move it. That is excruciating. And I'm not just, well, I mean, excruciating or excrudimating because we don't want to always blame it on her. You know, excruciating. We, we don't want she to be blamed all the time for something happening. Jeez. Anyway, the pain is severe to the point where I can't get real sleep. And they just did an MRI on Friday. This all stems from my falling in, out of that hammock, that new hammock that I purchased from Amazon. And right after I purchased the hammock from Amazon and they wanted to settle real quick, and I told them I'm still going to the doctor. What are you talking about settling? The amount of pain that I'm in? This has been going on for over a year. I don't take pain medication. I've learned to tune out the pain mentally. But because I spend a lot of time thinking about these laws and thinking about how to get around these stupid judges and thinking about how to get around these stupid attorneys, ladies and gentlemen, then I got to deal with a lot of you complaining, complaining, complaining about stuff that we're not responsible for. But what do I do with the tax credits? How do I do this? How do I do that? Ladies and gentlemen, you received free. So why are you coming to us as if we have an obligation to you when you receive something for free? Those of you who are student loan, home loan, and car loans, I know some of you $500 is a lot of money, $400 is a lot of money, $300 is a lot of money. If only you knew the amount of work that's going into this, you are getting more than what you bargained for. Go ahead and see if anybody else can do this to you, for you, with you, for the same amount. We are going to be there. We're going to provide the information. You are going to get what you paid for and then some because we've always done that. Those of you who are part of Amera Legion, we are now incorporating those of you who have homes. You don't get to choose the home. You don't get to choose the car. You don't get to choose the student loan. We can't do it for arbitrations because this is not for arbitrations. But you don't get to choose which home or anything like that. Those of you who have homes and you've already, not for the new people, this is for the previous individuals who were part of Amerilegion. 
If you want your home and everything included, then you have to be a part of one of these programs through AMCF, okay? But anyone who was there prior to, I believe it was November 1st, at Amera Legion, we'll be bringing you and incorporating you into AMCF, okay? One home, if you had a home, if you had a car, then one car, either one car or one home, either one car or one home, one of the two. We are going to do the process. We're going to take care of the paperwork for you. You don't have to do anything else. We already have the power of attorney. The rest of you whom we have your power of attorney, you'll be receiving information from us shortly, letting you know what to do next. Many people want to send documents, send documents. Why? We didn't ask you for it. Please stop thinking that this is a process that you've done before. You haven't. We will tell you what documents we need, and then you will send that to us. Those of you who want to get copies of what we're sending out, you won't. Why? Why won't you get copies of what we're sending out? Because it's not your business. This is our business. This is what we do. You're asking us to help you. So the documents are proprietary. You sign an agreement with us through the arbitration and through the limited power of attorney that this is proprietary information, that you don't have a right to this information. It's okay. Some of you may or may not agree with it, but that's not, that's not our problem. These are our, our procedures, policies, and prerequisites. All right, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, just wanted to give you guys a heads up. I just did a video for the individuals who are part of the student loan program talking about this exact stuff and the video only shows half the screen i'm using the very same software that i'm using now to do that video and it showed half the screen so when i say that they have tapped into the system they're interfering with it please understand that i wish i could make that up now i have to go because wednesdays is the longest day of the week and i really have to get this stuff done and then I have to go take a break because we have our meetings tonight. And with that being the case, I got to be prepared for the meeting. So thank you all very much. We hope everything continues to go well with you. We have a lot to talk about here on this channel with Redress Right and on the Redress channel. I don't know how much longer I'll be able to continue to put this information out for you, but I'll do what I can as Redress Right and not Eon. Have a good day, everyone. Eon still says he's sick of y'all. Okay, I'm I'm just telling you what he told me, okay? Eon says that he had enough. He ain't got time for y'all. Redress says he's willing to put up with y'all a little bit longer. All right, I gotta go. Take care. I'm out.